All right, so you're listening to Knives Monroe versus the podcast, and I have someone that I've worked with and have known, more importantly, for a long time, my good friend, Robert Gardner. Robert, how you doing? Hey, doing good, Knives. It's good to uh, be able to sit and chat with you. Yeah, man, it's cool that we get to do this remotely. You're, uh, I don't want to give away where you live, but you're a hop, skip, and a jump away from me. But being able to do yeah. this remotely, I mean, I think it's pretty convenient. I want you to be comfortable. So, so thanks for making time to do this, man. It means a lot. Sure, sure. So, always happy to. I think it was yesterday or maybe two days ago I saw that you were doing a, a podcast um, with a young lady, and it was just the quality was so good. I mean, you guys like cut to commercial, so to speak, and the production's actually yeah. so thoughtful. Um, t- t- tell me how your podcast is doing, man. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, I'm enjoying the process. Uh, Trent uh, Knox is the one who really spearheaded the tech component. Uh, what I'm good at is talking. So it's very easy because he takes care of the production process, including some of the scheduling uh, to help get people on. The part of me showing up on phone or on camera is, is pretty easy. Uh, the harder portion, I think, is the post-production and stuff that he does to like polish it and make it kind of nice. Um, I really enjoy the podcast as a format, and I noticed almost immediately after even two or three episodes, you have an understanding of certain things. Like You understand pay-per-view isn't HBO, isn't Netflix. But it's not until you really get inside that you start to understand some of the nuance. And one of the things about audio that I was most impressed by was people can listen to audio while they're in the shower. Very passive, they can listen yeah. To, they can listen to audio while they're in the car or you know, in their earbuds or on the bus or whatever. So the way they consume audio changes how you deliver your message. That's been the most interesting component of the podcast itself. And I think myself as a former philosophy student, you know, I could listen to an entire lecture over the course of a semester and then they'd go, okay, test time, you know, write me a five page essay. And I go, okay, I'm long winded and I can have that long form conversation, which always doesn't necessarily translate as well to video, but I think podcast is almost a perfect format for it. Man, you're, you know, if I do say so myself, you're kind of like me, or maybe I'm kind of like you in that you're, you're a multidisciplinary, multifaceted, you know, public speaker. Like, I enjoy seeing you on Snapchat, but also you crush it on Facebook Live. You're great in person. I've been there for countless talks. And now, now podcasting, you know, I feel like you pivoted kind of seamlessly into that space. And, you know, I consume podcasts probably more than any other form of media because, like you said, it's passive. I can do it when I'm walking the dog. I can turn it on, and now I'm inspired to want to wash the dishes or what have you. So totally, man, you know, that's how I, I caught you guys yesterday. And I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before, but uh, I, I text message or messaged Trent, and I was like, man, I can't believe you're doing this right now. This is really impressive. You know, it's live. I can see everybody, you know. Um, Robert's getting his message out. Plus, of course, you can chop it up into micro content. Like the post-production stuff is so invaluable. So I really dig that you guys are doing it. And I always knew it was going to be a space that that you would excel at, man. So that's fantastic to hear. Yeah. Yeah, it's worked out uh, really well. We've had discussions about longer podcasts, but I think it'll just be a matter of time to kind of uh, get, get situated. How, how long do you have them usually? Uh, right now we have them for just about an hour. Occasionally we'll have one like 90 minutes. Um, I'm actually interested with certain, uh, speakers in doing longer form podcasts that are maybe two or three hours. And people said, Oh, you know, well, will people listen to that? And I go, well, real fans will, I mean, right. it's not for ev- everyone. Like the, the depth of the conversation, I think also cultivates a different fan base. Not everybody, if they like a certain author, is going to read every book they ever wrote, including their short stories. That's right. And I'm sure there's hardcore fans of Stephen King, but only watch the movies, probably don't even yeah. read the novels, right? And so they're yeah. still fans of the of the source, essentially. So definitely, man. Um, so uh, I haven't seen you in what feels like a long time. And I think the last time we vibed may have been that I can remember back in April when you had like your little 
I don't want to be condescending. I said little, but like you're, yeah, I, I want to call it like a summit, but what did you, what did you call that class? Oh, the um, class we had at Lauderstein Conway. That was huge, man. I mean, it was such yeah. a great turnout. It was packed. I made like a little 40 to 50 minute short form documentary. If I'm being, you know, if I'm being uh, generous to myself and that was such a fun weekend. Um, you know, have you done, have you done more of those lately? We kind of take a break uh, through the winter, usually around holiday season, classes slow down. We've got some new classes that I'm rolling out this season, and we're still trying to organize uh, class dates because increasingly I'm traveling out of city and out of state to teach. So it's, it's like this juggle between, for me, between classes, clients, and retail. Um, trying to juggle those things to keep everything kind of moving seamlessly. It's almost like running two or three businesses at the same time, even though they're interconnected. I'll always go back to teaching in person, and I love doing that, but the logistics of getting people in a room can be a bit challenging, especially if you're going out of state. Very interesting. Um, You said something I want to touch on about traveling out of state, and I want to get into that. But real quick, just to add some context to my listeners who normally listen to this show and they're, you know, I'm, maybe I'm doing a chat with a filmmaker, a musician, a comedian. I'm talking to Robert Gardner from Robert Gardner wellness.com. And he is a maestro at, I'll say body work, uh, just because you have really broken down the, the semantics and the shorthand of what we previously knew as massage, right? So if I were to call you a massage therapist, I feel like that kind of almost limits what you really do and who you really are, right? But essentially, I guess the shorthand to your average pedestrian is that Robert Gardner is a massage therapist, right? It doesn't matter. He can work on you with if you're on a table, if you're on the floor, if you're in a chair. I mean, he can climb on top of you for crying out loud. And, uh, so I'm a big, uh, you know, I think it's really cool what you do and people need to see what you do and they can find your YouTube. Uh, you're one of the most prolific voices in Austin, whether if you're whatever sort of media that you propagate, like you, I mean, you make content every single day. Like, do you have a a set schedule for the podcast or you just do it whenever? No, no. Um, Trent and I are working together to try to organize those things for both of us, for our sanity. Um, I just at some point realized that social media took away the barrier of entry, which means you just feed your fans. It doesn't matter if it's Snapchat or Twitter or podcast. You just feed your fans and keep going. Um, I don't have an extremely set schedule, and that's where in-person classes get interesting because, you know, like when I'm in class, I have to be attentive in class working with the students there. So, It's only occasionally in class I can take out my phone, shoot a Snapchat while I'm teaching, that sort of thing. Um, We just continue to use social media and to try to figure out what the best schedule is going to be. And also, as the business has grown, I feel like I'm running a media company primarily. That's what I do. It's like... I produce video, I produce audio, I, you know, today is technically a day off. And when you contacted me to do a podcast, I'm like, well, yeah, of course I'm going to do it. Like, what do you oh, mean? no, I, I got you working on yeah. your day off, man. I did no, not know that. No, no, no. But the thing is like this, this is the thing I think people don't understand when they're not in an entrepreneurial space. I live and breathe what I do. You do. If I felt like it was deleterious to my health, I would slow down or stop. But I absolutely love the building process. And I, I understand tell. that just this podcast is a new fan. I can tell. And er- every, every time you reach out, every video, every Twitter, every hashtag, you know, is a potential to build like a new connection with someone That's true. Um, in a global marketplace. So when I release content daily, I just, I don't know. I, I think mostly what it is, is I, I've literally gotten to a point, even though it is work, it's like, I just play with the platforms yeah. And go, what's going on? What do I need to put out? What do people need to know about? What's, how do you give them updates? How do you feed your fans? And then occasionally the phone goes on a tripod and I press YouTube live and I go live and give them a quick snippet of what's going on and uh, class updates or whatever information I feel like sharing. It's just become a daily part of what I do. And I think when I, I was thinking about this earlier because I knew I was going to be on the podcast 
Because you and I have had so many uh, conversations about social media and about film production. You are definitely involved in the art of post-production in, you know, editing. And like, you know, like you said, it was like, yeah, for me, it was like, oh, I got a YouTube video from you. From mm-hmm. you, it was like, yeah, you got this little documentary. That's right. I'm still figuring out how to leverage certain media. And at the same time, I just play with the platforms. Yeah. Um, you know, and when I say play, I mean, you know, it, yeah, it's work. We know people contact me for business stuff, but it's like, how do I engage with people on the platform? And I understand increasingly over time that TikTok is different than Instagram is different than Twitter. Yeah. So when I was a kid watching MTV, I remember seeing uh, the real world and then uh, road rules. Reality TV. And you, yeah. You had this sense when, when reality TV started to hit, you were like, oh, they're they're kind of just recording what they're doing. Yeah. But I couldn't have seen like cell phone technology getting to the point where you were doing the real world with your phone. That's true. That's a very good point. Daily, no less. Yeah. Yeah, that's nuts, man. You know, I'm on your YouTube page right now and you you you're you're breaching 9000 subscribers. So Mazel Tov for that. That's awesome. Like I I it took me 12 years to break 1,000 subscribers. Wow. Yeah, it's nuts. And you have an accumulative 2.2 million views. Yeah. And that's amazing, right? Out of, you know, aggregated over 930 videos. Did you know that you have created that many videos, that many pieces of content? I, I, I forget and I don't check. <laughs> I mean, that's insane. And that's YouTube. That's YouTube. So, like, your SEO is, is, is nuts. Like, I'm sure you put in the tags and everything. I see massage, Austin, Round Rock, instruction, time massage, massage education. Like, these are, like, your tags. And so you're yeah. one of the first you're, – you're the guy. You're the, you're the time massage guy on the internet, you know, and, and that's just one platform. And then you have Snapchat. Are you on TikTok? How do you, how do you feel about it? Yeah. Um, so TikTok right now, when I talked about playing TikTok is the platform I'm currently, in my opinion, the most engaged with, Really, I'm trying to make different content on TikTok because of the nature of the platform itself. And we, we talked about with you, like I really admire your art of post-production, like the editing process and the sort of like, you know, for me, I get, oh, okay, I get a 45-minute video. For you, you're like, yeah, I spent like two days, yeah, like editing, cutting, trimming, you know, that's right, splicing footage, you know, audio. This TikTok allows me in maybe a minute format to do something similar with very simple tools mm-hmm. on my phone. Mm-hmm. So you can make funny content. Um, I mean, there are massage therapists on TikTok, but they're few and far between. Right. So I've been making content related to like, uh, I started reading selections of the Devil, Devil's Dictionary by Ambrose Bierce. And Ambrose Bierce was a As cynic. As one does. Um, a, a, say it again? As one does. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and it's like, it, it's, it's, you know, it's strange. It's different, but if you're on TikTok, it's a very creative platform. And instead of just releasing massage-related content, I wanted to release stuff related to philosophy, history, other interests of mine. And I've done that just to to diversify what's there because there's personal brand building in what I do. Um, And I notice over time as our exposure grows, I would say maybe 10% of the audience is supremely engaged and they comment. And then that 10% of the audience splits 5% absolutely hate what I'm doing. And the other 5% absolutely love what I'm doing. And they're the most vocal people who either like share or comment negatively on what I'm doing. The other 90% mostly just kind of watch. Yeah. When I make stuff on TikTok, TikTok as a platform is just Ooh, is different. Um, I really, I just think it's the most fun. Um, it only took me after downloading the app a couple of days, and I realized I probably spent two hours with my reading glasses on, just flipping through people's videos because uh-huh. it was so in like you forgot you were on your phone. You were just so engaged with this platform. And I don't remember the last time I was that engaged with YouTube or Instagram or anything. Yeah. Not to the point where I was playing with it. That's, that's what was happening on TikTok. Yeah. And so do you think that's a testament to how fun the, the app 
itself is? Yes. I, I think um, I told people it's like you're going to compare platforms based on what you've experienced previously. And I told people that TikTok is like Snapchat on steroids. Mm. Yeah. Um, it allows certain functionality to be able to post produce something and like just stop start technology. You can stop the camera, restart it. Yeah. So for instance, in comedy videos, you can play various characters. Of course. You can change your wardrobe, but you're doing it, you know, inside the app. Um, I would hang out with a colleague and the colleague is around my age and they have kids their kid's 15 years old, and then they're using their phone, and I see that they're on TikTok. I'm like, oh, hey, you're on TikTok? I am too. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, you want to make a TikTok video? And they just look at me like, whoa, this old dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this old guy's on TikTok. <laughs> I, I guess I, I think I understand what you're saying. Like, you know, when I make a video, when you say post-production, you mean – well, I got to take the footage and I got to sync it with the sound and I got to import it into my editing system and I got to organize my files by color based, whatever. And then I got to splice, 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 and then layers on top of layers, got to add an effect, a subtitle here, a song here, export it. Then I got to Dropbox it to you. And then I'm like, what do you think? And it's just so much work. Yeah. Whereas with the power of your thumb, you can curate and create your own content. Now you're a content creator. That's what you mean. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think, I think the democratization of that opens up room for, for so many potential Mozarts that we didn't know were out there that now have an opportunity to show people, you know, where they are on the spectrum of creativity. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a a couple of people that I follow on TikTok, mechanic link, and then, uh, pegmaster 2000. Mechanic Leak is a mechanic, and I first saw his video, and I was kind of taken aback at first because it was just a mechanic showing you basic mechanic stuff. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, cool. It's like car talk kind of. Like he's, yeah. you know, but then he does very funny videos in relation to, you know, mechanic stuff and, you know, makes jokes about auto Odysseus, and it looks like some sort of religious <laughs> thing related to being a mechanic. And then Pegmaster 2000, um, most of her videos, the the photo that you see when you scroll through her main feed are just pictures of the sink. But it, she shoots most of her videos in what looks like a bathroom. And then when she scrolls up, she's holding like a big jar of kimchi or a rice cooker or a vacuum. And she just does like little bits of essentially what looks like stand-up comedy you know, little poignant observances about life, you know, in her, you know, bathroom mirror, but completely hysterical. I mean, just little 15 second clips, but she just developed her own shtick. And it's like, you know, this young lady has a global platform. Wow. She's able, like, you know, the distribution, it's just hard to explain, you know, being 42 years old, having seen the real world when I was a kid on MTV. And then seeing what we have now, there's just no barrier of entry anymore. When, when we have to explain it, we have to recontextualize the past. We have to tell people, no, you don't understand. Like, there was four channels when we grew up, period. <laughs> like, that's why it's difficult to explain. But for these people, it's oxygen. It's second nature. It's all they've ever known. Of course, yeah, TikTok, yeah, yeah you make music, whatever. The music is in there. Yeah. I mean, I remember yeah. Napster, to, uh, 1999, like... You know, people did not want you, unless you bought the actual tangible song, you can't use it, you can't play it, you can't record it. But now it's yeah. just like on every Instagram story or on every TikTok. And it's like, I'm like, how do these, how does Pharrell make money off of that? Like, I don't know how that works. And it doesn't even fucking matter. Oh. Anymore. Yeah, the, the music part, um, I have regular conversations with Josh Terry. He's a, a good friend and colleague, and we, we, we meet regularly and hang out. We're great friends. And he's a musician, and we're having these ongoing you know, conversations <clears throat> about this because the music industry was hit extremely hard because of Napster and online streaming. I don't think the music industry is is dead by any means. I think that fundamentally what's happened is you can't treat the music industry like it's 1965. Uh This is not 1972 and you're not Led Zeppelin. That was a very different era of the album. Yeah. 
the, the, the music world right now, like I keep cornering Josh and go, Josh, you have to make 15 second clips and upload them to TikTok now. Yes. yes. People can make videos to your music. And it's, it's like trying to get a musician from a point where, and in Josh's case, he's very much a perfectionist. So he has a very epic sense of like what he wants to create and art, which doesn't necessarily always include a 15 second, you know, audio clip on TikTok. But the music distribution has completely changed. If you make a, a nice clip on TikTok and people start using it and it goes viral, it all links back to you. Oh, that's beautiful. So, For now. Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful, man. Yeah, I, I think about that all the time. Like, you know, I will say, like, if I could just segue for a bit, um, I've, I've been on the phone so many times today, and I feel like I've said this a few times, but it's the first time I've said it on wax. You know, I have a filmmaking background, and so it's a very expensive medium. You put $10,000 into a fictional piece of material that ostensibly just becomes like a Blu-ray and then you, if you're lucky, you put it out in a film festival and maybe select elite, deem it great enough to want to buy, or you're in the business of selling tickets and maybe you make enough, you sell enough tickets, you've made enough commercials and flyers and you've done the interviews and all that where you can sell enough tickets to make your money back. Like it's such a racket. It's so, it's difficult to make a movie and to be in that business and to sustain yourself. John Luke Goddard, who was in the uh, you know French New Wave movement of the 1950s and 60s, like you know, he still makes movies to survive. He doesn't have a nest egg. This guy's like 90 years old, and he still makes movies to survive. And this is John Luke Godard, who's like on some people's Mount Rushmore. And I say this yeah. because you know I've put so much time, energy, and, and you know a decade and a half into this. Money, the equipment is so expensive, as you will know. And, you know, the network of people that you have to have and all this stuff, it's, it's multidisciplinary. You have to be a salesperson. You have to be a camera person, an editor, a sound guy. You have to know what quality looks like. You have to be a good writer. You have to know how to tell a story. You have to fail in public. It's all this adversity. But now I make podcasts and I get my messages out there easier than ever. You talk about the, the barrier of entry, like it's completely disappeared. And it's like, wow, I, I can make a... I can make a podcast that costs nothing and my message is out there. It connects with people and there it is. And it's essentially, it could be more profitable than making a movie. But in a way we, if I'm filming this, I am making a movie, you know? And it's just like, what, what the hell is going on, man? You know, uh, it's, it was so weird to like hang out with musician friends and be a filmmaker and be like, I can't show you what I do. I can't perform a magic trick in front of you, but my musician yeah. friends give them an accordion or give them a guitar and they can go ham and that's awesome. And so finally <clears> I kind of feel like I've pivoted in a way I still have my background. I still, you know, film every day, but now I kind of feel like with podcasting, you know, I can show you what I do and I got the stats to prove it. And now I'm entering this entire new space that didn't really exist 10 or 15 years ago. Like radio, there was like Howard Stern and that was it, right? Yeah. Now, if you're good enough and if you're prolific enough and people give a shit and you articulate your message clearly, simply, you can develop a whole community of rabid fans. And now you can, if you're smart, smart business person, you can then potentially segue that into maybe producing a movie or something. You know, it's so, it's so weird how it became, how it became kind of um, like you have to find the best way to communicate something and then link it back into your business, let's just say, right? And if you're a musician, it's never been a better time to put yourself on TikTok, to put yourself on Spotify. Like, you know, maybe you, maybe they put your song in a movie or in a trailer or like in a TikTok, like you said, and it goes viral. Like, there's really no excuses anymore. What are the excuses? Uh, well, what, what excuses there's, do there's you find? There's plenty of people do, who can complain and try to make excuses, but they're soft. <laughs> And what do you hear? Like, what are some excuses that, well, that come your way? Well, with musicians particularly, I, and this is not Josh. Josh is adapting very rapidly. We have lots of conversations. But I've talked to a, a musician, uh, and Austin is full of musicians. Of course. It's, it's the live music that, city of the world or whatever. Yeah. It, it's not that making a, a living as a musician isn't difficult, because it certainly is. And the landscape for that has completely changed. But you have to understand the music industry doesn't control your reach anymore. That's right. Um, you know, black blues musicians, 
used to be just raked over the coals by recording companies because they controlled distribution. That's right. So they were paying the artist peanuts. Well, now you can go direct to consumer. D to C in the music industry, you know, I keep trying to explain to musicians, they're like, well, you know, I can't make money selling albums. And it's like, would you sell them a beer koozie? Would you sell them a t-shirt? Would you build a fan base? It's like, listen, you're complaining that you can't sell like the Rolling Stones sold in 1970. But what you're failing to understand is you can go live on Twitch in your pajamas every Friday night (laughs) at 9 p.m. and play a two-hour concert in your pajamas, in your home, in your house for all of your fans, and they can donate money live and all talk to each other around the world. So why don't, why, why isn't it, everybody's on social media, you know, Facebook has 1 billion users or whatever the current number is, like, surely you'd think we'd be all all on the same page on this paradigm, but people are existing in a old paradigm, are they not? Uh, well, the, the, the technological shift has happened so fast, even I don't, don't fully understand it. I spend more time looking at it than most people, but the, the technological revolution has, has shifted so... I mean, listen, as a kid, I played Missile Command on Atari. You're old as fuck. I'm 42. <laughs> like I'm not even I'm not even that old. Now you're just and ten I'm years like, older than me. Technology, like you had an idea that yeah, you know we might try to go to Mars. Sure. You know, and yeah. Elon Musk is like, let's do it. I know. <laughs> like you know, it's like the technology has shifted where you know, it's hard to explain what happens to a person's consciousness when they go from missile command to what we're doing right now in 42 years. Yeah. Like it's just it it's so fast and here's the thing we don't know what technological developments are coming. Just 5G. What does that do? Yeah, I know. I have no idea. Yeah. I'm scared. I'm scared. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm not scared. I I just you know, it's kind of like um uh, when it comes to social justice issues, you know, I, I have conversations with people like, oh, it's so bad now. And I'm like, hold on. I mean, it is bad. There are things going on that certainly need to be addressed, major systemic global issues. However, would anybody want to live 100 years ago? Of course like, not. Like, things are bad. Right, of but course. But it's like, the problem is we have technology that allows us to communicate about how bad it is. Like, this shit has been going on forever. We just have cell phones where you can film it now and see it, and you can't ignore it. Wow. No, that's a fact. That's a fact, man. Um, Gosh, I think about that all the time. Like, on Twitter is the new newspaper, and we all sit on our toilet, you know, catching up on the news or whatever it is. And uh, it's no different than a newspaper. Now it's just more interactive. And now I'm reading other people shout into their phones in my own voice. So now the noise level has increased for sure. But those people were always there, you know, you ever watch like an old movie and you're like, wow, that's like modern time. Like when you watch like <laughs> network, you know, for the first time, this movie that was made in the seventies or whatever, you're like, that, that looks like today. It looks like right yeah. now. So it's always been there for sure. But now it's just louder and in our own voice. And maybe, maybe, it, you know, the human bandwidth is just not wide enough to intake it all for sure. Man, it's funny. Yeah. We talked about Napster, I remember I got on, I made a video talking about, like, I didn't go to film school. I went to Pirate Bay, right? And I remember Napster, I remember Kazaa, Ares, all these different torrenting platforms, which now, you know, the FBI is listening to me right now, but uh, all <laughs> allegedly, of course. But um, it's just funny. Like, you know, I've always been a, a child of the internet. And I saw it read, but even me, someone that like would read screenplays online when I was at the public library or somebody that had an old school AOL email and uh, Hotmail and all that stuff, like when, when the internet was barely maturing, like even I like missed out on Vine. Even, even right now with TikTok, I'm like, oh, I don't, I feel like I don't get this. Like, it's so strange. Like even me, who's pretty culturally savvy and tech savvy like it moves too fast for me like the at the rate i'm making content i still feel extremely at inadequate like it's not enough and i'm not on all the platforms enough and it's it's weird like uh 
the inadequacy is not unlike the the inadequacy of being on a diving board in middle school or something or having to give a class presentation in high school like it's still very sophomoric the inadequacy but there's just so much going on man like it's i don't blame your average plebe for not necessarily knowing where to start the paradigm is just is just too vast and too ubiquitous and nobody knows where to start so when people find you your sort of your silhouette is carved out as an expert your people say well robert you just tell me how to do it how how have you found just with you being prolific as a video creator as a as a multimedia guy how have you found it's it's changed how people trust you and how has that affected your business uh, early on i i didn't really understand the way i do now um you know, when I started making video, let's see, so it's 2020, so it was probably like 2012, uh, give or take, when I started my YouTube channel. I didn't know what YouTube was. I mean, I knew you'd see videos there, but I didn't, I didn't understand the positioning in regards to SEO or Google owning YouTube, or at the time, I guess they were separate companies. Um, I didn't really, un- I don't know, I just didn't, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, I understand news, understood newspaper. I understood cable. I understood you're on CNN. I didn't understand Twitter. Like what, I don't know. What is this? You know? Yeah. Um, over time, as I continued to make video, what happened was, and this is the positive feedback loop. Mm. I had a website, I had a YouTube video and I went, Oh, I can put the YouTube video on my blog post. Yeah. And the blog post is just a chance for me to write, just like I talked about that essay in college, and I'd write like a little thing, put a bl- video up. Um, I got a phone call from a gentleman in San Diego, and he booked an appointment with me at my old uh, home, my old home studio. And this was just a dilapidated kind of rundown uh, rental home we were living in at the time. So I booked the appointment. He came in several weeks later. I gave him the session. He paid me. I made money. That's a very positive feedback loop. Yes. And when I said, hey, how did you find me? And he said, oh, I I just looked up Time Massage in Austin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I went, what? Like, he's like, yeah, Time Massage is is ubiquitous in San Diego. It's everywhere. You can can get Time Massage everywhere. But I was going to be in Austin for business, so I just looked up Time Massage. Well, Time Massage is a more distinct keyword. And I, Mm. with about three months experience, had skewered that keyword so that Google showed this guy my stuff and I got money. And I went, wow. Okay, so let's do more of that. And as I continued pursuing that, what happened was you got a sense of the fact that I am the real world now. I can control my image. I can Mm. control the content. I can make it funny. I can dress how I want. You can build personal brand. You can connect with an audience. You know, I got a phone call from a young lady in North Carolina yesterday. She's watched my videos. And of that 5% that loves what I do, she just, I mean, she just waxed poetic about Robert. This is the future of our industry. Mm. Your, your, I have to study with you. This is amazing. And here's the thing. I've never met her. The, the positive feedback loop is once you start doing it and you realize, wow, all the stuff that I want to do as an artist and all the stuff I want to do is helping people social media is allowing me to exponentially build an audience. And when it comes to something like somebody being a musician, and I talk about direct to consumer, you know, think about it this way. If you have a thousand hardcore fans Mm -hmm. and you can get those thousand hardcore fans to pay a dollar. That's right. For exclusive access or whatever. It's like, if you can get them to do that every month, you're going to make 12 extra grand that year. That's right. That's the sort of scale we're talking about. And it doesn't matter that they live in Bali. Like -hmm. the internet is increasingly just tearing down uh, barriers. And when it came to a sense of professionalism, being a massage therapist, most people's conception of massage is four things, table, cream, glide, and nudity. Oh shit. Robert's going on. I love this. This is my favorite rant ever. So, so for people to trust me, they have to trust a strange guy 
going into his home. He doesn't have a formal business like office and they have to be comfortable coming to see me. Now I don't work on a table primarily. I teach students on a table to get them started, but, and I also don't work on people who are enclosed. So I kind of had to educate my marketplace about what I do and create a sense of comfort, ease, calm. As I continued to build, what happened was people assume things about my professionalism based on the fact that there are 930 videos on the YouTube channel. That's right. Based on the fact that I have a podcast, based on the fact that I travel and educate. And all of those things add up to this guy is a professional and whatever he charges is worth it. And that image building is what changes the game, especially for me as a male therapist. Now, it'll change the, the game for anybody involved in business. But, you know, if you are a local Austin musician, what you have to do is you have to get your stuff in front of me on some social media platform because I don't go out a lot. I'm, I'm not going to be down on 6th Street anytime soon. That's right. That's just me. It's how I am. But I'm in my home, and I'm on my phone. And if I see a clip and you cover a Sunhouse song, so now it's a cover song. I'm familiar with Sunhouse. I like blues. I go, ooh, what's this? If I like your song and I click like or I share or I follow, and then I go search for you on other platforms and find like 500 videos on your Instagram – I can become a fan and I can start contributing to your cause. I cannot do that if you're not putting that content out. That's correct. Yeah, we've got to this point where, you know, if a, I don't know what the, how the metaphor goes, but if the bear shits in the woods, does it, what's, how's it go? If a, if a tree falls in the woods, that's people the one. hear it? That's yeah. the one. And, and the answer is no. The answer is no one fucking hears it. The answer is you don't exist if you're not on these platforms and you claim to have a business or a brand or a garage band or whatever it is, like some sort of uh, outward facing product or service, like you, you don't exist. And that's, that's a scary, that's a scary fact, man. I think about that all the time. Like perception is reality. There's a lot of people that, that presume because I do something daily that therefore I'm some sort of authority figure on that. That's, that's interesting. That's upside. That's, that's, that's potential leverage, is it not? I think so. I mean, it, it's so um, – so podcast-wise, Trent and I have been interviewing people within the massage and body work marketplace. <clears throat> we are slowly trying to reach outside of that, and one of the things that's happened for me is my uh, music taste. Not that, well, my music taste is shifting. I'm, I'm noticing certain genres that I wasn't paying as much attention to. And I think as an entrepreneur, I have a much more focused attention on hip hop mm -hmm. because I think hip hop is the most progressive, um, adapts to technology the quickest. Um, marketplace for like music at the moment. I could agree. So with that. I'm interested. I'm interested in having you know conversations with people and say like the Austin hip hop community, which Trent is trying to help me with. And what I think is interesting is likely what's going to happen is we're going to have people on our podcast. They're going to go, "What? Why am I on some massage therapist podcast?" And then they're going to talk to me for an hour and go, "Oh my word." This dude just went over every social media platform talking about the nuances marketing and building an audience and, you know, brand building and personal brand and merch. And the thing is, I, I kind of applied some of that maybe hip hop methodology to massage and body work, which is weird because music is very, very different in the sense that it pulls on your heartstrings in a way that massage related video might not. Um, you know, Post Malone and listening to Post Malone, I have a um, a, a sort of musical affinity and emotional attachment yeah. to him as a person, as an artist, because I've been so touched by his music. I don't think people are touched by massage and body work, video and audio the same way, but pieces of the marketing are the same, especially from the fact that for me, I go direct to consumer. The people who pay my bills are clients and students. That's right. Those clients and students have to be adamant and fervent fans, just like the young lady who called me from North Carolina yesterday. You have to build that. And I'm very much like you, Knives. Like, I'm in the middle of the art, and I'm kind of figuring it out as I go. 
Yeah. It's not that I'm an expert. It's that you evolve into becoming an expert. You know, when I started my business with my wife's help and a little bit of, um, she knew a little bit more about business building and about social media than I did. I was very confused. Now, in any room with massage therapists, I'm the expert on social media. Oh, they yeah. come to me and ask me questions. I went to a, a LinkedIn Live locally, and I thought, okay, this, this LinkedIn Live, or LinkedIn Local, I should say, um, is a meeting of like local North Austin you know, business people, entrepreneurs who are engaging in an in-person networking meeting from LinkedIn. Mm, how did that go? So I... Oh, it was great. I mean, but I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to find all, I'm going to meet all these great people and they're going to have all this stuff to share with me. What happened was you had three or four people bum rushing me and asking me questions about TikTok. Very interesting. And then you realize it's like, you know, progressive in one industry is like different in another industry is like, yeah, they, they're engaging in business on some levels, but it's like, I think, I think I looked at it like, oh, I just have this little provincial kind of business. But for them, they went, whoa, you were a massage therapist, and now you're dealing with education and online distribution globally? Whew, tell me about that. And then it was just that discussion, like, the marketplace continues to change. Like, th- there's nothing about me right now. So you call me, say, I want to do a podcast. Great. Ice T could call me tomorrow and go, listen, I want you to be on the podcast. And I go, sure. And, and I could sit and have a conversation with Ice T and I, we wouldn't even skip a beat. It yeah. doesn't, it doesn't, how do I put this? Um, I don't find it intimidating. I don't find uh, people to be above me or lower than me. Of course. I'm just hanging out with people, having a conversation, discussing business because Ice-T is a businessman. That's right. He understood the game within music, within hip-hop, within film, and he pivoted from industry to industry and built a very strong brand. That's right. Yeah. And it's interesting, man. Um, I It's hard for me personally to gauge and – measure that perspective that, you know, it's like I'm a basketball player that, that operates at an NBA level or aspires to. And so I get, I do the reps, been doing it for a long time and I'm comparing myself to the LeBron Jameses of the world that when it comes to the average people that play on the corner, yeah, I'm I'm better than them. I, I could teach them a thing or two. And I forget that. I forget that, you know, I look at podcasting like, yeah, anybody can do it. Or YouTube videos, yeah, you just you got a camera on your phone, just push the little red button, and away you go. But people don't know. It's really interesting, and I, I have to remind myself that I completely take it for granted that you know these are uh, bankable skills, as someone once told me once upon a time. And uh, you definitely have that in spades as well, not just as a communicator, but relaying this information and. Being somebody in your demographic that can relay this information to other people who aren't as inoculated in the scene as you and I are, yeah, people people put a lot of um, credence in that for sure. And so I think whether you've meant to or not, just by putting the reps in, um, I've totally become an expert in your field. So let me ask you this, Robert. Um, you're diversifying your interests, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I can't say anything wrong with that. Um, I think you're more than just... Uh, time massage guy, right? For lack of a better term. Um, but what about going all in on a niche and like those 1000 hardcore fans? Like, do you still see that? How do we, how do we juggle that? How do we manage that while diversifying? Like, what do we, what's the balance there? How do you figure? When you say what's the balance, what do you mean? Well, you know, at the end of the day, you're operating a business, you know, you want to make more revenue than you did the quarter before or the year before. And so you're trying to grow your clientele and increase your statistics, your numbers, you're, 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 you're growing a business, right? So yeah. do you see yourself, um, as far as your brand, whether if it's on TikTok, say you make a funny video where you're wearing a mask or you're interviewing a cool rapper in the, in the, in the Austin scene, like how does this go, how does this funnel back into your business or does it, or does it not? Yeah. I mean, so let's say for the next two weeks, all I did was interview people in the local Austin hip hop scene. Initially, the people who come on the podcast are going to go, what? I mean, they want exposure and I can expose them to my audience, but let's say we had great interviews and those interviews go well. 
and they go, hey, can you come out to our show and do like a little, you know, I don't know, chair massage or something before our gig? And I go, sure. So what does it look like now when a white guy with long hair and Thai fisherman pants is like hanging out with almost, I would assume is like a completely black crowd in Austin at a hip hop show. When I'm hanging out with rappers, what do I look like? In other words, now I don't have a car with uh, nice rims. I don't have a fly ride. I have a beat up 99 Honda Accord. Mm -hmm. Now I take this local Austin guy and go, listen, can we shoot some video, uh, just some Instagram, like of me getting out of your car? Yeah. You know, do you, do you use any of your music? And I don't know this, but, or we could do it on TikTok. Do you use any of your music in the video so I can put it in mine or whatever? There is a networking going on. And initially people think, wait, but this isn't like, he's not, you know, selling massage. And it's like, no, I'm selling lifestyle. Interesting. I'm, I'm selling, you know, um, a certain way of living. And that way of living is modern. It's not 1980. This is not massage envy. Like, that's not what I represent at all. And that builds some flack. But what I'm saying is when you're flipping into different industries, if I talk to somebody who is in real estate development, yeah. I can just as easily, you know, flip into real estate and start talking about, okay, so the money in real estate is you buy low, sell high. It's a long-term thing because your money is going to be tied up. You know, your liquid assets are tied up in the real estate. You know, it's a different business Mostly what I'm dealing with is personal brand building. And for people in the hip hop community, rappers, musicians, um, overall in Austin, you know, the personal brand is the thing. Like if you build that hardcore fan base, after a certain point, it's just exposure. So, you know, I went to the point, like I said, I feel like I'm running a media company. I sold a service. That service was massage, meaning I work on one person at a time. Then I started teaching classes, and when you start teaching classes, wow, I can teach like 10 people at a time. Mm -hmm. So now I'm making money times 10. And then I made retail, and retail shipped, and then eventually retail was online, and you went, oh, wow, like I'm I'm selling information now. Right. And information scales. That's right. And as we continue doing that, I'm like, wait, hold on, can we do a subscription service? And, and the people I was working with were like, yeah, the, the platform we use allows us. And I was like, oh, my, are you kidding me? Like, I was, once we hit that, I was like, okay, the, it's over. Like, there is no stop. The train is, the train is, the ship is sailed. Like, we're, we're done. And the thing is, I could talk to colleagues in my industry, and they'd go, I don't understand. What's, what's innovative about a subscription service? And I go, there is no subscription service for massage education in at this entire industry. And I, from my garage, have created a rabid fan base of 500 therapists who are paying me each month to have exclusive access to my class footage to be able to ask me questions in the private Facebook group because I'm bypassing regulation. I'm bypassing school owners in the industry. I'm going directly to consumers, which are massage therapists I'm teaching, and I'm trying to scale information globally. Once you do that and I'm getting messages, I'm not lying, I get messages from people in Turkey. I get messages from people in Iran. I get a subscriber from somebody in Tokyo. You get somebody asking you questions from Mauritius off the coast of Madagascar. Once you start dealing with that, the world is a very small place. Brand building is just about personal brand building and finding your audience. You know, you can be involved in some very niche activities and build a fan base that you can then eventually find a way to monetize in some form. When I'm on Twitch, people think of Twitch as a gaming platform, but there are young ladies on Twitch who make uh, popsicle crafts. Mm -hmm. They're using popsicle sticks and making crafts. And you can literally sit down with these women for hours and popsicle craft at home while you're hanging out with them. And these women are making money. People are donating money to their channel because they want to hang out with this person and make popsicle stick crafts. That is completely unprecedented in human history. 
there is just the technology is allowing that sort of thing. And when it comes to brand building, I talked about hip hop, talked about music. You know, it's it's getting to this point where when you sell information, there's image involved. When when it comes to social proof, people think different things about me when I'm sort of a eh, maybe gawky kind of awkward white guy, but now I'm hanging out with rappers. So what do people assume about me? Well, they assume I'm gangster. They assume I'm amazing or, you know, whatever, even if I'm in a completely different industry. You know, if you and I started hanging out with Kevin Hart, you and I started hanging out with The Rock, you and I started hanging out with Elon Musk, people look at us differently in a sense of social proof. And in the age of social media, you have direct connection to an audience that you can monetize in ways that simply just were not available 20 years ago. Man, that's fascinating. I think you're operating at a whole nother level, to be honest. Like, this is taking diversification and really just shattering the gamut wide fucking open for me because I take the whole niche concept, which I've never really swallowed that pill people will say find your niche who's your audience what's your gimmick right and that's a difficult pill for me to swallow because things are so general and nebulous like to find it i think about david lynch you know david lynch gets to do whatever he wants but his movies are so particular and he has rabid fans that are going to be there and that have stuck by with him over the decades and so i know i know it's possible like i can't necessarily describe what like a Knives Monroe guy looks like or gal, but I like your approach of really kind of vibing with, you know, it's multicultural. Like, uh, that, that's really fascinating. I'll, I'll be honest. Like it's something I never would have ever pitched to you as a, as a body worker. Right. Um, yeah. but it makes sense because proximity is power. And ultimately this is about, this is a people game. This is just a people game and it's a form of like segregation. If we're cutting ourselves off from potential people that are maybe outside our genre or comfort zone or what have you. So you tackling that is kind of, it's, it's very interesting. It's almost counterintuitive. I think it's really cool. So you, I think you're onto something there for sure. And to be fair, this is how, you know who thought of not who thought of this, but someone who kind of agreed with this i this whole concept is um, you know when they brought cocaine into the states, they weren't like, hey, let's just leave cocaine in this Korean neighborhood. No, it's let's open this to everybody. Let's let's take this to the rock stars and to the comedians and to the actors and to the politicians, you know, and they, and who will they give it to, right? So social yeah. media and all these techs were able to explode with that idea. Drugs, which is a multi-billion dollar industry, was able to explode with that idea. Why not why not body work? Yeah, I mean it's it's a weird industry. I can tell you this: in in my industry currently, people are just abjectly confused by what I'm doing. I think in the short term it doesn't make sense. I don't think they're having a, a big picture analysis. I think people who are my fans right now, they have a certain image based on the stuff we put out. I'm going to start interviewing, talking with people in the hip hop community. If that goes well, I'll probably delve into it more. I'll probably become more of a fan, start listening to more of their music because I'm trying to be in touch with what's going on in that industry, especially locally here in Austin. And people are going, I don't, why is Robert, why is he interviewing some rapper? Like, right. what, what is this? And it's like, that rapper is engaging in urban entrepreneurship in 2020. And what happens they, when uh, they stop asking themselves that question? And they oh, accept well, the it and is, then it you've, inspires you've a new question. Outside, you, you, I'm sorry, say it again? You know, what happens when they stop asking themselves, why is Robert talking to these people and instead they accept it. And then what are the questions after that? Yeah. That's more deeper. It's more interesting. They don't understand that me becoming a social media influencer, me becoming a a podcaster is essentially what happens to Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan didn't start where he's at now. He's had a variety of hats from comedian to the UFC to, you know, whatever. And podcasting is a piece of that. You know, he's interviewing people from other industries. When I see Joe Rogan 
interviewing Ed Snowden for three hours. Yeah. The, the world has shifted in regards to media in a, a very fundamental way. I feel like because of my dealings with business, what's slowly happening is I'm working more towards being some sort of consultant. Mm. Because once you understand the business landscape in one industry, it's easy to apply it in other industries. What I'm most interested in and what I would absolutely love, just because I think hip hop is sort of I don't know. It feels like the opposite extreme of where I'm at. Like I'm looked at in this weird kind of provincial uh, little marketplace. You know, if I could help a hip hop guy with his business and understanding of like merch and uh, distribution, the importance of Instagram, Mm -hmm. if I can help them with their business, like how great is it to be able to assist other people who are just trying to come up? They're, they're trying to escape poverty. They're trying to build a business so they can take care of their families and communities. You know, that's a great thing. That's really what I'm interested in. It's like, you know, Knives, you don't have a, an interest specifically in like massage and body work, but we worked together and we connected because of film. And then I think because of social media specifically, Yeah, those connections across industry, it's very difficult to explain what, what, as, a, as a boring, dry word, what networking is. Networking is just, it's not just handshakes anymore. Mm-hmm. It's phone calls, and it's podcasts, and it's mm-hmm. Instagram, and it's videos. Yeah, totally. No, you're on to something, man. Uh, I said this a few, a few podcasts ago. Uh, I took my podcast daily, and I've, I've been seeing such a tremendous, I mean, from zero to 100 influx on my depth and the amount of people it's reaching, but also the amount of people that are reaching out to me like that, that hasn't happened in a while. And so I'm going to, you know, you know what happens when you stop, you don't know what happens if you keep going. Right. And a couple podcasts ago with my wife, we were uh, doing a show together and she, you know, I told her we were talking about 2020 goals and you know, she had, pretty good goals like you know pay off some debt you know make more money just good stuff lose weight whatever and i told her you know for me like i really just want to improve my personal relationships with people like i've come from such a world and i've grown so cynical almost to it of just like this monetize well how you know what are your numbers and like the ad sense and just all this money 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 i fuck i'm i'm fucking sick of that conversation like personally like i got approach today to uh i feel kind of bad saying this but um to do some coupon code for somebody's event and i would get like a cut of whatever and i was like look the day i ask for my audience to buy something i want that to be special and i want it to be something you know maybe i write a book or something like i'm saving that i don't want to just do that for some short term whatever like it's just not my bag right now but you know I really want to improve these relationships and I care more about people far more than I do about currency. Like people is, you know, people are currency and not just your people or the people on your block or in your community, but really outside, like what you're saying, you know, people outside your genre, outside your comfort zone, people cross platforms and cross cultures. And I definitely think, you know, not in a, what can I get out of it sort of sense, but more of like, what can I do for these people? What can I do for them that I've never done before? I mean, let's, let's be honest, you know, like I'm sure you're fucking blue in the face, sick and tired of, of preaching to the choir and talking to people who, who don't fucking get it right now. But there are people that are more inclined to swallow your message that are on the up and up that are, you know, hipper, wiser, smarter, more keen to what it is we're talking about, what it is you're talking about. And so if they're going to listen, why wouldn't you want to talk to a hip hop guy or a professional wrestler who at the end of the day, you know, he's never even thought about stretching, never even thought about the upside of like more, maybe you can heal his back pain or her back pain or whatever. Um, Breaking into these different scenes and really making it about people first. I truly believe, yeah, you know, like, you know, I think the money will follow. It always kind of does. But making it about people first, I truly think is a worthy goal. And I, and I like that. It's the most interesting thing I've heard you rant about it in a while. I love all the, the tactical sort of like what, 
kind of SEO things should I do or like my thumbnail or how do I grab their attention in the first two seconds? Like I love all that stuff. It's fun. But at the end of the day, like you said, man, I mean, I feel like you nailed it. You know, networking is more than just hot dogs and handshakes, right? And making yeah. it about people first, man. I mean, I think you're on to something. I think if you chase that dragon and it goes all the way, whether if it's through TikTok, through podcasts, or whatever the means are, like, people are going to want to hear what you have to say. And I, and I believe that people are going to want to fucking pay you to say it. Yeah. That's what it's all about, there's, Robert. Yeah, there's so much that when I deal with business people specifically... When I deal with business people, usually small business owners are who I'm in contact with. Almost always, we have like a light conversation, just like you and I are talking now. And I go, "Hey, uh, what are you? What are you dealing with? And what can I help you with?" There's no there's no discussion about money. There's no discussion about whatever. They want to do like a little consult with me of sorts, just a friendly conversation. It's like I do that for free. It opens up all sorts of business potential because you're just trying to help business people solve problems. Um, other industries, like my industry, there there's very little social media production. We're, we're, we're gangsters as far as that's concerned in my industry. Massage therapy just is not adapting to social media quickly or fastly at all. It's a very organic. You, you might as well make you know furniture like you're the Amish or a shaker without nails um, <laughs> in comparison. Like it's just not, you know, and, and plus also with massage, you're dealing with, in many cases, naked people. So it's not as necessarily social media savvy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I keep pushing that, but when I deal with people, it's like, what do you have problems with? What do you need help with? If I talk to someone who owns a Mexican restaurant and they're trying to figure out how to get more customers, inevitably I'm like, okay, listen, let me come to your place. Uh, let me use your phone, whatever's tied into your Instagram. Can the cooks like show me some videos? Can they make like quick videos? Do they show me how they make the salsa or how they're preparing certain meals? Mm -hmm. And they're like, what? They, they just don't, I don't know, businesses are still marketing like it's 1980. That's what I see. The reason I'm very interested in rap and hip-hop is because it's so progressive. And I feel like in the process of trying to help them build their art and dreams and businesses, I can glean information from other industries and how they are dealing with essentially what's the distribution of products and services. Man, you're really onto something there. I think you should... You should see this out, follow it through, and squeeze as much out of that lemon as possible. I think I think it's infinite juice to be to be quite frank, man. I want to be very respectful of your time. We've been we've been going about an hour. How's it looking for you? Oh, I'm totally fine. Okay, cool. That just to fun, you know, well, as we're winding down here, um, what does 2020 look like for you? I know you're di diversifying your your reach when it comes to different demographics and not to sound so clinical, but you know, just different people, cool people, you know, people outside your, um, your optics, right. Uh, that most people don't necessarily assume that you, that you'd hang around. I, I like, I love that idea quite frankly. Um, but what does 2020 look like for you goals? You know, where do you see yourself, you know, Q2, um, this is a whole new decade, man. Like we don't know, when you chart 2010 to 2020, I mean, I don't think anybody, I don't think any one of us saw this coming, man. But, um, you know, you're going to spend the rest of your 40s in this decade, right? So what do you want it to look yep. like? What are some of your goals? What are some benchmarks that you want to hit? And what do you want to walk away with? Hmm. I know you're a very goal-oriented person. Yeah, it's, it's always just, you know, on a daily basis, it's just like, make it better than it was yesterday. It's like my, my to-do list. Is That's that real Jiro basic. dreams of sushi um, shit right there. To the last part again. That's that Jiro dreams of sushi itch right there. Yeah. That, it's, that it's fucked like, me up for a couple weeks, man. <laughs> Just, I, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Let's talk about it because I've been wanting to talk about it. Um, <laughs> not to steal your thunder, but just like, Everybody had pitched this movie to me for a long time. And it was just like, I'll yeah. get to it. I'll get to it. Never saw a trailer. Didn't really know what it was about. Saw it in the first two minutes. I was like, oh, shit, I am in. I guess what I respected <laughs> about it. The, and, and that's why I started doing a daily podcast was because of that movie. 
not that it inspired yeah. that exact messaging, but to me, it was about how can I perfect what I do? How can I be the yeah. best at it? How can I produce the best show, the best messaging where people ask like, how'd you do that? And it's like, Oh, well, like he went to the tuna market, like he, what he does with the rice, this guy massaged a dead octopus for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it matters. It matters, though. And like the the orgasm in your mouth when you put one of these rolls, I've never had one. I'm actually going to Japan in a few months and I, I think I'm going to be on a different island. But um, I would love to visit that place. I know Jiro's still alive, but uh, uh, just all the effort and the time and the decades that went into one little sushi roll, the fact that it only sits 10 people, the fact that, you know, he there was a part in the movie where I think like this this party comes in and it's the seating is boy girl boy girl boy girl and he seats it you know starts presenting one role at a time to everybody and somebody makes the comment hey you're paying more attention to us than we are to you and he says yeah I have to you know this is all about your experience he, I noticed that this woman eats with her left hand so I changed the way that I presented the role in front of her those little things it's like you're 85 years old you have no business doing this <laughs> caring about this so much you should stop even his own kids are just like bro you're good this is let's and i'm the type of creative that like i'm like let's just take it to 80 percent and call it done that's always been my philosophy because you'll you'll spend decades like on one little thing but it it brought me back to this place of mastery and, and you've used this word before, and you're the first person I ever heard used it, betterment, about this idea yeah. of betterment, of like incremental betterment. And it's like, I've, th I've been thinking about that sonically. Like, how can I, it's basically like writing a real-time memoir, like these podcasts, daily podcasts sort of thing that I'm doing. It's a large tapestry. It's like this, it's going to be this big, giant mosaic when it's done whenever that is that people can always go back to and that'll live forever and that'll be my body of work and so how do i make this experience better and how, you know the different the differentiation different how do you say that like the distinctions i guess of like oh i'm not going to use that mic i'm going to use this or i'm not going to use those cables i'm going to do that and like making this thing better i i love that to death so man i got to tell you like you're you're reinvigorating me with with this concept of like, you know, just being better than you were yesterday. It's truly marvelous. It's, it's self-improvement. I, when I saw Jiro Dreams of Sushi and I've, I've quoted Jiro in some of my time massage workbooks, um, I've recommended the film repeatedly to students and colleagues. And I have a keen interest in food and cooking and food related documentaries so Jiro set up this, this trope, and the trope is the Asian master. Right. Um, the first time I saw it as a kid was the Karate Kid. It was Mr. Miyagi. Of course. Mr. Mr. Miyagi, wax on, wax off, and it's like Danielson's all confused, and it was like, oh, he was like training him to like physically be able to deal with these you know, arduous tasks in martial arts. Jiro embodied that sort of Zen master uh, this Asian quest for perfection, um, where people in parts of Asia are revered because of their age and their yeah. practice. And, you know, in the, in the West, we tend to do the opposite. We revere people who are young yeah. and vibrant and healthy and That's whatever. Right. But that sort of incremental improvement and pushing the lines so far to create something new, uh, to create art, something that you could be proud of, knowing that, yeah, it's not perfect, but every day you went in and you tried to do it as, as, as well as you could. You were pushing the edges trying to make the perfect piece of sashimi, the perfect piece of Edo style sushi. Yeah. It's like, it's such a small, like, it's just a roll, man. Like, can't you just make a California roll? And it's like, right. Ooh, but he's, he's pushing this to the level of like, you know, you spent 60 years plus crafting this art form 
And that is what is almost impossible to explain. To, to give you an example, massage therapists on average, are you ready for this? I'm ready. On average, they retire between three to five years into their career. Interesting. That's, that's longer than I'd think. They, they, they burn out. Yeah. They have problems running a business. They hurt themselves physically. It's very physically arduous. Um, I've been a massage therapist now edging up on 20 years, and yeah. I'll probably be able to do it until I'm dead. And Fucking I've hate. completely changed, just like when Jiro, the, the you know, massage the octopus for 40 minutes or whatever, yes. it was like, oh, I just... I, I'm just like pacing in my house, throwing my arms up in the air going, Oh my God, this is it. This is it. This is, this yeah. is what I've been doing that nobody understands because it's not done in my particular industry. That's right. It's nobody's ever, they were like, what do you mean your sessions are three hours long? What do you mean it's mat based and the person has their clothes on? What is this crazy suspension system and all this abdominal work? And I'm like, listen, I'm trying to produce some of the best body work on earth, period. End of story. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to stop. It's to the point where, you know, like, when does one activity? So, this is the, the, the constant ongoing challenge. I'm a yoga teacher as well. So, my work at times between active and passive looks like some blend between massage and yoga. Now it's very effective for chronic pain, but both of those communities, the massage community, the yoga community are kind of looking at each other and saying, well, it doesn't really fit our community. It belongs to that other one. Right. The massage therapists say it's yoga. The yoga people say it's massage. And I go, why can't we just go help people? Like, Jiro was not interested in crafting and developing what would essentially be considered like new roles. Like Correct. he's not making California roles. Right. Like he's focusing to extreme detail on the rice, the fish, the little bit of soy sauce or whatever preparation method he's dealing with. You know, he focused on a particular style of sushi, which is Edo style. When it comes to what I'm doing, now you're in a position where I'm not only trying to sort of honor the tradition, while at the same time you're doing what Americans do, which is like, how do we change it and make it better? How do we improve it? How do we make this more widely available? How do we allow the massage and body work you know, to diversify, differentiate, improve, and offer a superior service for, say, you know, pain, which is primarily what my focus is. Those questions, those questions are so weird in my industry. People are going, that doesn't make any, that's not even possible. And I'm like, I can give a session to a client. The client will completely freak out and go, I don't understand. I wasted all that money on massages why is what you're teaching not available everywhere? And I say, because massage therapists don't believe it's massage. When I work on a massage therapist, they get a session, completely freak out and go, dude, I don't understand what you just did. What the hell is this? And I go, do you feel okay? And they're like, dude, I feel amazing. I have never had anything like this. This is not massage. That's where as an artist, I feel sort of stuck in the end, I just continue honing my craft, and I just continue developing and growing, and I just recognized in Jiro Dreams of Sushi, it's this ongoing quest for perfection. It's like the person who is just completely adamantly focused on, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to devote my life to, and this is what I want to perfect. I want to perfect it and hone it as a craft, and it means that you're creating something that, and I always talk about this in my classes, Jiro is not worried about competition. That's correct. There's a, there's a sushi He's shop down just the street, thinking about I guarantee Self-mastery. Yeah. Period. It's always a question of what do you want to do? I'm not, I'm not denigrating the California role. I happen to love them. I'm, it's like sushi exists um, in a very broad uh, cultural landscape in Japan. It's conveyor belt sushi and That's it's right. what Jiro does. I'm not denigrating one or the other. They're just different experiences and he chose what he wanted to do. Just like me, I said, listen, you know, I'm working in a chiropractor's office. They only give me 30 minutes or an hour because of the insurance billing. Right. 
these people are having issues that are related to their overall sense of wellness and well-being. The sessions need to be longer. <clears throat> I started in private practice and went wild and crazy and did two-hour sessions. Within a couple of years, I had lengthened that to three hours. Massage therapists were the first people to tell me, you cannot do that. And I go, I can't do what? And they're like, three hours? People aren't going to pay for three hours. And I'm like, my checking account says otherwise. <laughs> you have to sell a different service. That's it's great. like uh, movies. You know, I think at some point uh, in the 80s and 90s, maybe movies were like an hour and a half. Yeah. Now I'm seeing more movies of two hours, three hours. I think the medium and the distribution and uh, dissemination of film is changing how people consume it. Like, you know, because of Netflix and like streaming services, for instance, you can now, people will wait until the season is over because they want to watch the entire season in two days. That's right. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how, how are we to say that that's not more optimal, right? Than, than it is waiting week week to week. Uh, it's it's interesting. Like Netflix, I'm very proud of Netflix. Um, it's the underdog, you know. Uh, it's creating so much new content and and playing with different ways of delivery, and it's really fascinating. I like what they're doing. It, it's hard. It's really the the biggest competition. It's hard to get out of bed and go to a movie theater sometimes if that movie's on Netflix. I you know it's. It's almost a no-brainer. And televisions look so great, and people's sound systems, you know, they look, they're pretty good, you know. I know it's not the same, and this is, like, blasphemous what I'm saying about the movie theater experience uh, to other filmmakers, but it's a hard thing to beat. Uh, I had some friends who couldn't watch the Golden Globes because they don't own a television, and I was watching it on TV, and I was like, get a TV, and they're trying to find a stream, and they called me a boomer. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, man, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But um, no, this idea of of how can I make this thing better, and and sort of reinventing what it is, and 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 uh, you know, gosh, it's it's um, Facebook did it, Pablo Escobar did it, you know, uh, Jiro does it. Um, that's that got you know, gosh, it. It got me to a point of like knives. I I don't care about trying to monetize and getting a new client. Like I I deeply just care about going to bed feeling like I fucking crushed it. I killed it. I did a good job. I got I got good feedback. I made people happy. I got the message out. I care much more about that than I do the receipt or whatever. Like all that other stuff comes with it. Jiro. I mean, that guy could open multiple stores. You know. Um, but I think he's going to go down in history as a guy who, who reached the critical mass. Like he's the he's the bar, and he keeps raising the bar. That's that's why I love what I love is because I want to get that feeling of like boom, touch that, match that. You know, um, it's much harder to do in body work for sure because it's so. Gosh, it's everybody has their own definition. You're fighting over semantics. Like, it's difficult. But if you just keep living your truth and doing what you're doing, Robert, people are going to catch up with you, man. And I know you know that. Like, just keep well, putting in a, those deposits. A, a thing. Go ahead. No, just keep putting in those deposits, man. And it yeah. will reach a critical mass. There's, there's, there's a piece where you can yeah, – so it's easy to get frustrated and say, you know, people don't get it. They don't understand my message. And in the end – you know, nobody's laying out the template for how does Robert become more Robert. That's like, right. you have to figure that out in life. That's and right. for me in business, it's like, do you make money? Sure. Like, you got to pay the bills. But the thing is, I just want to help people. And I go, okay, so forget what you were trained in. Forget what you were taught. You know, how can we create a service that's going to help people more holistically? How can we create a service that's more, more transformative, that not only encourages people's health, wellness, well-being, but is actually transformational to their life, that changes their perspective? Because when you get rid of muscle tension, when you have complete mental clarity, when you're, you're 
I don't know, you're like a consultant. You're teaching people yoga. You're teaching people meditation. You're talking to people about not necessarily prescriptive exercise or nutrition advice, but saying, hey, how's your diet? Like, how are you feeling? You're trying to... You're trying to help people with optimal health, which includes rappers, entrepreneurs, you know, soccer moms in Ohio. That's right. You know, it's it's working across those realms. And I think it's completely normal to be frustrated. I think Galileo was frustrated. I think Da Vinci at times was frustrated. I think... Eminem was at times frustrated. I think that's a normal part of the process. The general population is, in my experience, they're very accepting of mediocrity because mediocrity isn't challenging. Being average doesn't lead to adversity. That's right. Being exceptional does. I think it's a normal part of the process. And when you're breaking molds, You know, when you're the first guy to blend, let's ice tea again, if you're one of the first guys to blend like heavy metal and rap or hip hop together, you know, you get pushback because it's new, it's different. You know, all Bob Dylan had to do was take out an electric guitar and his fans are booing him. You know, it's like, it's hard for people to break out of certain predetermined boxes. In my case, I didn't care about culture history, tradition. I went, hold on. I live in America now in 2020. How do I provide a service that is going to have the maximum optimal health benefit for the largest number of people? It doesn't matter if people don't like it and people call me names. I always go back to that and go, go do that and just keep doing it until the message gets large enough. It's almost like people won't believe it until they can't afford it anymore. Uh, They won't believe it until it's just not available anymore because, well, Jiro is probably booked out for a year. You you probably can't even get a seat at his facility Mm -hmm. unless you've already scheduled a year in advance. That's right. You know, that's a different uh, scenario, of course, than doing massage and body work or educating. But in the end, this relentless pursuit of perfection you learn how to slowly and incrementally dampen noise and just to go where the supporters and where the fans are. Mm-hmm. Inevitably, if I think people are hitting adversity, especially in entrepreneurial circles, I think you have to go where your fans are and you have to feed them. That's exactly right, man. You said it, you said it better than I could. And I'm glad I got, I got you on this podcast, man. I called you out of the blue, kind of like a, like a, t- a cold text message. Sorry for not saying Happy New Year, but I'm glad you reached out, Robert Gardner. Where can people find you on the internet, man? Where can they support you? Oh, uh, robertgardnerwellness.com is my primary website. Um, you can download, there's a free time massage workbook on my website uh, that you can get. And also, if you look in our store, there's the uh, Reboot Insiders Club, it's called, which is our subscription service. There are about 450 hours of my class recordings from the past two years, uh, very raw, unedited, every curse-laden rant, bitch session, educational, working on a joint, elbow pain, back pain, this or that. Um, is just completely on display there. You can also find me across platforms um, from, you know, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, Twitch, like wherever you follow me, Uh, various names. Usually it's RG wellness, but I think on, I think on Instagram, it's like Robert G wellness one, two, something like that. But you can very easily uh, find me on YouTube. If you just look up Robert Gardner, uh, find my YouTube channel there. I'm all over social media. So please just use the free stuff that you're interested in. You're fucking um, but crushing it was great it, to uh, have a chat with you. It's great to have a chat with you. And, and uh, for people who are interested in, in Robert's whole brand, whole idea, whole concept. If you want to hear his musings, if you're interested in his subscription service, good news is on on this podcast, if you look at the show notes, there's a free trial available for you. So check that out. You can't say no to free. What do you got to lose? So Robert, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. It means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you again. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for having me on.